Are you new to investing? Wondering whether or not you can self-manage your properties? Let us tell you about our partner, Rent Ready. Rent Ready is an awesome property management software that can help you grow and handle every aspect of your real estate investing business. Rent collection, tenant screening, maintenance, lease signing, listing. Honestly, Rent Ready has everything. One of the best features is their new tenant software, Latchel, where you're able to remove yourself as the landlord from being the middleman between tenants and maintenance calls. And it's also essentially a fraction of the cost of what you would pay for property management. Let me also mention that Rent Ready is unlimited. All their plans are flat price. This means you can keep adding properties to your portfolio without having to pay more. You can close on all the properties you want and Rent Ready's price stays the same. Best part about it is for you guys is they've given us an amazing deal to pass on to all Weekly Juice listeners. You can get 50% off any Rent Ready plan at rentready.com when you use our code JUICEPOD. That's rentready.com, R-E-N-T-R-E-D-I.com with code JUICEPOD, J-U-I-C-E-P-O-D, and you'll get 50% off any plan. If this is your first time here, welcome. During our shows, we interview successful entrepreneurs and investors to spread knowledge, advice, and actionable tactics to help others in the pursuit of financial freedom. We discuss successes, failures, systems, motivations, experiences, and key lessons learned along the way in the hopes that these stories help you along your journey. Tune in every Wednesday to get your weekly juice. If you've been here before and like what you've been hearing, please subscribe, share with friends, rate and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That goes an extremely long way for us. It's simple. Just click on your podcast app, type in our podcast name, The Weekly Juice, click on the reviews and let us know what you think. The more ratings we get, the more eyes we'll get on our show and in turn, we'll be able to provide you all with high quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram at Weekly Juice Pod for daily content and personal finance tips to assist in your journey towards financial freedom. Welcome back to the Weekly Juice, where we talk real estate, personal finance, and entrepreneurship. As always, it's your boys, Ryan and Corey here with another episode for you. Today, we had on special guest, Michael Zuber. Michael is a real estate investor, mentor, coach, podcast host, and the author of the book, One Rental at a Time. I had the privilege of reading this book recently, and we thought it'd be amazing to bring him on the show and just share his wealth of knowledge. He's got 20 plus years in the industry as a real estate investor. He's come from absolutely nothing. He's talked about eating a potato a night as a young child and working his way into a commission-based job, making a decent amount of money, then losing it all in the stock market and transitioning into real estate and absolutely flourishing. So, yeah, he's really transparent and really willing to kind of share any bit of information that he can. And to be honest, that's a lot of information because there's not that many people that we've interviewed that have been through several market crashes, upturns, downturns. And the thing is, is he just stayed with it. He started out one rental at a time and then he was able to recycle his cash flow to, to, to kind of use the same money to buy bigger deals. I, I don't think there's that many better people to talk about when to talk to when you're talking about scaling a portfolio. I couldn't agree more. I think um, I say this every so often, but definitely get out a pen and paper here for this one because he does really give actionable tactics and what you can use along your journey, especially if you are between your you know first first rental and ten rentals, even more. But um, he has very good advice for for young investors, and we we definitely very took notes. detailed advice, like specific niches. He what he calls a uh, a buy box. So listen for that in the show. Absolutely. So without further ado, let's bring in Michael. All right, Michael. Officially, welcome to the Weekly Juice. We are thrilled to have you. We uh, you've come highly regarded uh, in the industry, and we are. I, I mentioned to you before, I, I've read your book already and absolutely loved it and think it can provide a lot of actual tactics and value to our listeners. So we thought, why not have the man himself come join us on the show and hopefully draw some knowledge on our listeners. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Uh, I was, uh, if you would have seen my high school grades, you would have never thought I'd be turned into a writer. So uh, let's just say English was not a very good class for me. You fooled me. So it was great. Um, if you could, for people that don't know you as of yet, can you give a little background on who you are, where you're from, and then how you got into entrepreneurship and the real estate investing, I guess, industry? Yeah. So my story starts probably like a lot of folks out there, right? We got, uh, we went to school, we got a good job. We tried to make a lot of money. You know, we had a family. We just, we, I enjoyed the rat race. You know, I got married at 19, which, which uh, not a lot of people know, but uh, by the time I was 30, I had a master's degree. 
uh, in business. Uh, I was in tech. I was making six figures a year, uh, helping to raise a daughter. And, um, you know, I was, I was the successful one in my family. However, I didn't have any financial wealth. Uh, I had just been burned in the stock market, kind of similar to where we at today. Cause it was the dot com craze. I'm a couple of decades older than both of you. And, uh, I was kind of beat up. So at 30 years old, I'm, I'm, you know, suffered a, a six figure loss in the stock market. I'm walking through a bookstore, which they actually had back then physical bookstores. And I stumble across rich dad, poor dad, that purple book. And it introduces a concept I've never heard of called rental properties. I, nobody in my family ever had one of those. Didn't talk about it. Didn't know anybody that had it. And, um, yeah, that, that really was the start of my journey. So we, we go about getting our first rental property in, in Fresno, California, a little three bedroom, two bath house. And, you know, that's the beginning of our journey. So my journey to entrepreneur is on being an entrepreneur starts with being a failed investor playing in the casino, which is called a stock market, getting beaten up pretty good. And then going to become a rental property and just starting with a house and then a second one. And then a third one, hence the notion one rental at a time, because that's kind of where it starts. What do you think it was, Michael, about real estate uh, investing that kind of sparked your interest? Because you could have, I guess, theoretically got back up on the horse and investing in, in the stock market, although you probably had a bad taste in your mouth. But what was it about real estate investing that you think said, in your brain, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this consistently for 20 years? There were a couple of things. So uh, the first one is it was physical. You could see it, touch it, right? Uh, I was burned in the stock market by two frauds, right? One was Enron and the second was WorldCom. And I was a trained accountant. So I read their financial statements. Who knew, right? Fraud happens and um, never going back, right? I could look, I mean, who knows where the frauds are, right? I, you just don't know. So I was never going to do that again. And then the other thing about real estate, once you start looking at it, you get your buy box, you can build an unfair advantage, right? My buy box was really tight for three or four years, right? Three or four bedrooms, the Mayfair district, which is 93703, you know, between 12 and 1500 square feet. I didn't look at anything else. I looked at that one tight buy box for about three years and um, I knew it better than anybody else. So I had an unfair advantage. And when you have an unfair advantage, you can wield, you can get better prices. Um, you know, you can create value lots of different ways. So uh, I like real estate because it's an imperfect market. You, you can build an advantage over others and, and profit from it. So that's, that's what I liked. Can you talk a little bit about that buy box? I think that that's something that real estate investors all over the country or the world need to understand in order to be as profitable as they can. I know you've talked about that in several platforms. If you could just elaborate on what that is and what that means to you. Yeah. The one thing that was you know, I, I should have hit this harder in the book, but, but now that I've talked to more and more people over time, the thing that made me unique is I, I defined a buy box early because a lot, of, a lot of times new investors go, I want real estate. I want to be a landlord. And then it's like, what happens? Like, where do I go? What's the perfect market? Do I do houses or do I do duplexes? Do I do duplexes or fourplexes? You know, they just get all wonky and they never go anywhere. They waste time. It's horrible. Time is the only thing you can't get back. So I got really focused and it was just single family homes. Why? I had no idea. It's all I ever lived in. I didn't, I mean, I knew there were duplexes and fourplexes, but I assumed a millionaire's owned it, right? Because I had no context. And I just was buying three or four bedroom houses because that's what I grew up in. And I mean, I, I wish I could tell you something different, but that was as simple as it was. Absolutely. What do you think your, could you just talk a little bit about to our audience, what your portfolio looks like now and just give maybe an overview of, I know that you started out kind of obviously at this one rental at a time, that's literally what you did over several year time span. What does your portfolio look like now? And how did you maybe go about building it to that, uh, status? Yeah. So the portfolio today sits uh, just under 200 units, all in, all in a single market. I got to be really careful when I say that, because some people go like, I can't get there, right? It's too big, you know? Um, so let's go through the journey, right? The, the journey to get here is rather simple, right? So it's that first house, that second house, that third house. And then I was out of money, right? I came into real estate investing with 40 grand. By the time we got the third house, we had no more money, right? Done. You know, we were living below our means. We were socking away money, but we didn't have anything left. So uh, in that market, because we started in 02, by 2005, California saw some appreciation. 
So we did what was called cash out refis. So over about a year, we did cash out refis on our first three purchases. And that allowed us to get number four, five, six, and seven. So no new money. All right, it was all cash out refis, which basically I call it recycling capital. So the same 40 grand got used twice, right? That's, that's the first step. Now we fast forward, it's probably 06, 07. Uh, the single family market's hot. We can't buy number nine. And uh, I hear something called it affordability index. And the affordability index says houses are too expensive. So we sell. Uh, we do what's called a 1031 exchange. We sell a house and we get five units. We sell another house and get 10. We sell another house and get 13. So we move from houses to multifamilies at the perfect time. But that allows us to go from eight to 80, right? It's, it's, it's amazing how 10X works sometimes, but we literally go from eight to 80. And I document the math in the book, um, how we got there. Uh, so now we're sitting at 80 units in the market. The, the great recession hits. Right. And to show you how severe it was, the first house we bought for 107, we sold for 264. It ultimately gets retraded at 75 grand. Right. So, right. 107, 264, 75. So it was a, it was a you know, 70% off sale in California. So we're trying to buy everything we can. So by this point, we're having a little bit of money because you got a lot of units and cash flows fine. Uh, but we're trying to buy everything we can. So we start doing private money, something called a six and 20 program and, and all of that. But basically we take, we take, we take about 50 grand. It might've been 60 grand, but let's call it 50. And we again, recycle it as fast as we can for about a year and a half. Uh, we buy a lot of units. We buy a 18 unit building, zero down seller financing. Uh, you know, we go from 80 to probably 130, 135 by the bottom of the market, right? Cause we bought the whole way down. You just don't know where the bottom is, but we bought for cash flow. Right, we didn't care that our net worth took a hit. Our net worth took a hit for four or five years, but I don't spend my net worth. That's why these people talking about net worth and how much you're worth is nonsense. I spend cash flow, right? And I spend net net cash flow. I don't even spend gross rents. I spend net cash flow. Um, you know, so that grew. And then what we've done since then, we we've added more units on the way out. And, and I think we peaked at 187 was, I don't really count, but so many people ask, I counted. I think the peak was 187. We've, we've trimmed that back a little bit uh, because we sold an apartment, but um, we've added other houses. So we're, we're, we're about that, about that level. Got it. Great. That that's, that's a perfect, uh, you know, uh, story of how you got there. And I appreciate that. I think one of the things that we have to point out here is one of the things that you did that, um, may not be like the forefront is that you kind of escaped a middle-class mindset in a way. And you, you, you got yourself out of this mindset of working for money and mm -hmm. I'm just going to show up every day and I'm going to put the hours in, I'm going to make money and just live a normal life. You, you escaped that. So if people are interested in doing that, they, yeah. they can start one rental at a time like you did. What are the key factors that contributed to allowing you to escape that mindset? And maybe some of the things you did to, if you lived frugally or oh, yeah. just talk about that. Yeah. So actually I've, I've helped so many people realize this now. I think it's actually a three-step process. Maybe it's four, but we'll go through it together. The first thing I want you to do is over a weekend, you and your spouse or significant other, or you and yourself, I want you to sit down and look at your spending. What is your financial freedom number? And don't you dare tell me it's 5,000 or 10,000 because it's never a round number. A round number tells me you're being lazy. It's probably like $3,812 or $6,701 or something like that. So you got to know, you got to know what number, right? What, what is freedom? So calculate that. Uh, then number two, you have to look at your expenses. And this is what we did first. We looked at our expenses because, again, we were spending 100% of our income. We had two six-figure incomes and we had nothing left over. So we looked at it and immediately we whacked expenses 10%. Uh, that was that was in 45 or 60 days, 10%. But what people don't realize is we, we continued that for about three years and took it all the way down to 50%. Now, some of that's because our income went up a little, but most of that's because we whacked expenses. And we we only took care of our needs. We didn't take care of a want, a trip, a special, anything for a decade and a half. And uh, that's another thing that's a gift, right? We, we were in this together, the wife and I, and um, the financial freedom is actually pretty easy. It just takes time. And most people don't want to sac you know, they don't want to sacrifice a weekend, let alone a month, a year or a decade. It's just hard, I guess.
Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point to make, uh, and it kind of boggles my mind because what people are actually doing is they're sacrificing 45 years to work f- to build somebody else's dream, and they don't realize that they're doing it because society tells us in this in the the weird way that it does through the media is that this is just what you're supposed to do. Like this is just what people do. They wake up. They go to work, they come home, and then they just do it again the next day. And then one day you get to live these golden years when you really don't have the ability to do all the things that you wanted to do, maybe physically or even mentally. So I think it's, uh, I think that in mindset is is really an important piece there. Well, that was the big thing for Rich Dad Poor Dad. I mean, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just want to hit that again because I didn't know any different, right? I was I was raised in an environment where once I got a college degree, I was I was unique in my entire family, and I mean aunts, uncles, cousins. I mean, a simple four-year degree in, you know, whatever it was, the mid nineties made me unique in my family and let alone getting a master's degree. Um, so I was already successful at 23, right? I had already was making more money at 23 than anybody in my family. And I made more at 25 than I did at 23. And I would, I didn't know what to do with the money. I was just spending it because the rat race is real. It's like, you got money, go, go spend it. It's, it's unfortunate. So along with the middle-class mindset, uh, you used a couple acronyms in your book, ARC mm. and CRAP, <laughs> which is funny. Cash yeah. rich, asset poor, and then asset rich, cash poor, or what, what are they? Cash happy. For? Cash, cash happy. happy. Yeah. So CRAP's a big deal, right? Because uh, lots of people, you know, at different times they get cash rich, right? You feel it. And, and uh, but if you're cash rich and asset poor, i.e. CRAP, um, yeah, that's not freedom, right? That unless you have assets that are spinning off a lot of income, cash flow, having a lot of cash is nothing. And you know that's why the Dave Ramsey mindset kind of bothers me, right? You know, go ahead and live below your means, stock away some money, and forty-five years later, wow, you're a millionaire. I don't want to be a millionaire when I'm sixty-five, right? I want to be a millionaire when I'm forty-five or thirty-five or twenty-eight. Right. Far easier to do that with real estate if you if you get after it. What would you recommend for for aspiring investors that hear this? Right, they're like, great, I hear you. I need to I need to build up my assets. Like, how do I go about it? What are some beginner steps that I could go do just to maybe they have one unit, they have none, or they're just like they want to get involved and say, hey, I have all this cash. Like, how should I deploy it? What are my steps? Yeah. So for me, I got to answer this with my experience, right? So I don't have any partners, no JVs. It's all the wife and I, um, I don't, I don't wholesale, or at least I didn't wholesale while I was building my, my business or portfolio. It was all buy and hold. So what I tell people to do is go work for the man. Uh, I, I recommend commission jobs because you know, if you can do a commission job and, and make what's called accelerator money, you could, you can add a lot of income. So I tell people to bust their ass from eight to eight, And then they build their side hustle on the side. And uh, that was what real estate was for me. It was a side hustle that over time be replaced uh, to six figure income. So for me, it starts with focus and daily discipline. And and again, focus the daily uh, focus on the buy box, look at it daily, learn your market better than anybody else. And, you know, get after it, lower your expenses, live, live frugally for five, six, seven years. And you can live like however you want after that. Cool. Pretty simple. Let's talk about starting that real estate journey in the beginning and the buy box. And I think you, you did talk about it, but like, let describe your buy box so that our audience members can really hear the tangible things and how mm-hmm. detailed you are about yeah. what you're looking for. I think that's really important. Yeah. So the goal of a buy box when you start out is you don't want anything more than 40 active listings and you want, but you want more than I say between 15 and 20, right? So that's what you want. If it's bigger than that, like if you have a hundred in your buy box, when you're just starting, it's too big. And if you have three, it's too small, right? So that's where it starts. My buy box was, uh, so I, I only buy in Fresno. So Fresno's too big. Then I chose the Mayfair district, which is called 93703, but that's still too big. I said, I only want houses. Again, I didn't want duplexes, fourplexes, condos, apartment buildings out. And then in houses, that was too big. I'm like, okay, I don't want two bedrooms gone. I don't want five bedrooms gone. So only threes and fours. I don't want one bedrooms or one bathroom, sorry, gone. So it was three or four bedrooms, two bath homes, two car garage attached between 12 and 1500 square feet, single level. That was my buy box for three years. So to me, that's, that's really cool that you have it pinpointed down to a T, but my, I guess, rebuttal, right? Or what I think people mm-hmm. would probably be is like, okay, 
But what if deals don't come up like that in that small area in that specific buy box? Are you just riding this thing out and waiting until they do, or are you looking elsewhere? No, I, for three years, that's all I looked at. I didn't, I know, cause you, again, you could chase butterflies and you won't build any capacity or, um, you know, knowledge of the market. Right. And again, for the first 60 or 90 days, it's not about writing offers. I tell everybody I talk to you, you're not allowed to write an offer until you can articulate what an average deal is. So an average deal for me in that market back then was 8%. But once I knew 8% guys, the world's my oyster. Cause then all I have to do is write offers that produce nines or tens. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and in that 8%, was there a cash flow number or did you only, I know you talk a lot about yield. So was cash flow the number in your head or was it just about this, this yield that you talk about? It was only yield. I did have a minimum, right? I would never do a deal. It only had like a hundred bucks. It's too skinny. Um, so there was a, there was a floor, but yeah, they were averaging 250, 300, 333, something like that. But I wanted, I want a yield that was better than average. And it's hard, right? It's average is there for a reason. Anybody can get average. I don't like being average. Uh, I want to work for good or great deals. So I, if, if average was eight, I'd want a nine, 10, maybe an 11 uh, percent yield. That's what I'd be doing. Can you walk us through, um, maybe give us like a, like a hundred thousand dollar deal example of your yield. I know you mentioned that a lot, just so people, when they're going running the numbers, they're like, I understand yeah. what you're talking about with the eight to 10%. Yeah. Let me just write this down so we can get it. So let's assume it's a hundred thousand dollar purchase, right? Let's assume you put 10% down. So it's 10,000 bucks. That number will be important. So you got a loan for 90 grand. Let's assume rents, I don't know, 1200 bucks uh, or $1,200. Let's assume your mortgage on 90 grand is probably $500. Let's assume all expenses are everything all ends 850. All in means property management, utilities, taxes, insurance, reserves, all of that stuff. So I got to take out my calculator real fast. Sorry. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take 1200 minus 850, right? 1200 is the rent and 850 is all expenses. So 1250, no, 1200, sorry. Let's do this. 1200 minus 850. So that equals 350 bucks a month. I didn't times that by 12. Just to keep everybody on the page. So that's now 4,200 bucks, right? So what I do is I take $4,200 and I divide that by my out-of-pocket cost. So let's assume the 10 grand, was, which we've already done is the down payment. Let's assume 1,000 bucks for closing cost, And let's assume $9,000 was make ready, new paint, new carpet, trash outs, whatever it was. So out-of-pocket's 20 grand. You got me? Uh, yeah. All right. So, so then you divide 4,200 by 20,000 bucks. And in this example, I get 21% yield. That's, you know, obviously these are made up numbers, but that's how you calculate yield. All the, the denominator is all the cash to get the house ready, which is down payment, closing costs, plus make ready. And then the numerator is expected yearly cash flow once, once repaired. It's a simple formula. That's great. Your, let's talk a little bit about your make ready costs, because I think that maybe that term might be a little foreign to people. Uh, we, we know that when we have to turn over a unit, we, we just kind of call it a turnover. So I think it's something similar yeah. to that, but like what is maybe get, it goes into the make ready costs. And, um, and I think it's interesting to bring this up because we, Ryan and I have bought properties where we put no money into it and we think there's no make ready costs. And then, you know, two months later, the, an AC unit goes yeah. three months later, a hot water heater goes. And then we even realized that like, those were actually our make ready costs. And we just didn't do it up front because we we're young and we we're just getting involved in the game. And now we know when we look at a property, what are the things that we have to, I think I'm just explaining make ready costs, but go ahead. I'll let yeah. you do it. <laughs> yeah. That was an excellent job. <laughs> yeah. So, so make ready cost is interesting. And it only came to me when I look backwards, I, I got to tell you, I didn't know about it when I started either. And it basically came to me because I was not buying the right deals in the beginning, right? The make ready basically boils down. You can buy properties that are zero down. Think today, people call them turnkey properties, right? They're already remodeled. They're already rented literally $0. But what I was buying was junk. Right, it was the stuff that had the old carpet needed to be painted. Maybe the bathroom tiles or the old lime greens or whatever they were, you know. So I had to fix it up. And today, when I buy a property, I will I would replace the water heater and you know the things that are are you know that are look bad. That would be all my make ready. 
right? So whatever it takes to put, make the asset perform, right? Because again, I have an expected rent. I could probably rent junk, but I'd only get 800. If I want to rent pride, what I call pride of ownership and get 1200, I got to do all this stuff. So I just make sure it's in there. And I will absolutely compare a turnkey property with junk because sometimes turnkey is a better deal, right? Maybe it's mispriced. Maybe they expect rents wrong. You know, who knows? But sometimes junk's better. It just depends on the market. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So I, before we get too far into it, but I know we're kind of walking along your, your journey here. I know you mm-hmm. transitioned from single family into multifamily. Yep. Can you talk about the difference? Because a lot of people or how you feel about the difference between the two types of properties, because a lot of people just starting out, they're like, well, Hey, should I go the single family route? Should I go right to the multifamily route? And I know things change and the markets kind of swing. So what are mm-hmm. your thoughts there? Yeah. So if we take the sort of mantra today, there's obviously a, a very famous um, content creator who talks about bigger is better, right? That's kind of his stick. And he's anti single family homes, at least most of the time. Uh, I got to tell you, I own stuff like that and bigger is not better, right? It's absolutely not better, especially in a market where cap rates are compressed. People are overpaying. Uh, so I actually compare multifamilies and single family on the same spreadsheet every time. I, I will buy whatever's the highest yield. Um, I can tell you the worst deal I ever did was my first multifamily because I assumed the expense structure and the tenant turnover behavior was the same as a house. And I was uh, rudely awakened um, because again, multifamilies have a lot more expensive than single families. For example, water, yard care, uh, turnover is much higher in units that are attached versus, you know, single family homes. Um, Yeah. So yeah, the, my worst deal was my first multifamily because I didn't. My calculation was just wrong because uh, I had a whole list of expenses that I didn't take into account. I think that's and, a great point to bring up, Michael, because we I have a duplex that, and um, <clears throat> we've talked about this before, but I have a duplex that I have on a huge lot, and it's when I ran the numbers, you know, I didn't factor in that I had to pay an average of $60 a month cutting the grass. And I didn't factor <laughs> in that, that, that the water meter wasn't separated between the two units. So there's no way for me to charge the tenants. So right there, I'm talking $60 a month to do the, the lawn. And I'm talking roughly a hundred, to $120 a month. So you're talking $200 a month that are my expenses that I cannot pass on to the tenants where in a single family home, all the utilities are on the tenants. So it's, it's really important to find out because $200 a month could be your entire cash flow. Luckily I had some spread in the deal, right? But you talked about how, what's the average uh, time frame that somebody lives in an apartment versus that lives in a single family home? Because this is part of it too. And yeah. another thing that factors in. Oh, it absolutely is. And and again, I had the luxury of looking back over two decades now. So my average tenure of a single family home is eight years, just like 8.1 years. And a uh, apartment is two years, just on just, just under two years. And And you get one turnover on a skinny deal. You're, you're negative for the year. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that, that vacancy right there can really, it's something that people say, well, oh yeah, I'll turn it over. But depending upon your market, it may not be three days that you turn it. It's not going to be three days that you turn something over, right? It, it oftentimes takes a month and a month is one twelfth of your cash flow for the year. So it's, it's, there's just so many pros and cons, whether you're buying single, or you're buying multifamily. And I think it's, it's really yeah, about I, I, your personal, um, yeah. I guess it would be your, like just how your tolerance level. Well, you got to know the market. I mean, again, I've done this for 20 years. So houses were the best investment kind of 02 to 06. Multifamilies were great 07 to 12. It was all rotten 13, 14, 15. Uh, then coming out of it, multifamily was best. Multifamily value add, you could not go wrong buying a multifamily value add 2015, 16, 17, 18. Those were the best years. You could be a horrible operator and make a lot of money. They started turning bad in 19, 20. They're just overpriced. And so I believe single families and multifamilies go in different cycles and everybody wants them in the same cycle. They're, they have different cycles. So you can, you can bounce between them. I think that's a great point to, to bring up because right now there's so much speculation on what's going on with the market. And you're, you're kind of, you're, you're leading us in this direction. I'm curious to know what do you think's happening in this market? Because everyone has an opinion 
And I have my own too, but it's only because I speak to smarter people like you that help form them. So I'm really curious. You've been through two full, maybe three market cycles in 20, 25 years. So like, yeah. what do you think's happening right now in, in the market? Yes. Yeah, so when you say the market, we've got to, I'll, 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 there's really two markets I generally talk about. There's the multifamily market commercial and then single family. Uh, so we'll do single family first. I think single family, generally speaking, has had a great year and a half. It was 15% last year, it'll probably be seven or eight this year. I think single family is going to plateau. Uh, we're going to see a lot more supply on the market. We're going to see a little bit less demand. Uh, we're going to see tighter lending standards. Um, so I think it's, it's single family housing slowdown, no crash. Multifamily, on the other hand, is setting up to behave very badly. Multifamily is surprisingly, and I've actually talked to multiple apartment syndicators. It's, there, it's the debt structure is wrong. Why did single family collapse before? Because they had two and two and twenty eight teaser loans. They had adjustable rate mortgages. The debt structure was toxic. What they're doing in multifamily now to get these stupid cap rates sub five percent is they're doing interest only loans. They're doing bridge debt, and. They're just betting on appreciation, which is never a good idea with real estate. Um, so I think multifamily is going to have a very big pain in 2023 and 24, uh, because once it's when the debt structure resets, right? The bad loans were written in 05, 06, but it, it's not until the two years were up in 07, 08 that the stuff started blowing up. Do you think that means that there's going to be some sort of crash. Can you define what you feel like that actually means? Because it could scare people to potentially not invest. And, and I think that me personally, I don't see a crash looming. I think that we're seeing 12, 15, 20% returns. It may stabilize, but that, but I'm okay with three or 4%. I bet on that yeah. in the beginning anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's, so let's define the terms. That's a great idea. So anything above zero is good, right? Anything with a positive number is good. I call a correction negative one to negative 10. Anything above 10, we can call a crash for this conversation. So single family homes, no crash, and only a correction in a couple of very small markets. No national crash. The national home appreciation for 2021 will be seven or 8%. For 2022, it'll be three or four. And 2024 will be one or 2%. So all positive numbers multifamily, that's a problem because multifamily is valued on what's called a cap rate. And if we get interest rate rise in the next two years, which I fully expect, uh, they're going to have to have higher cap rates. Uh, if they can't raise rents to match their higher uh, mortgage payments, their NOI will be hurt. And thus the value of their buildings could collapse. I did some very quick math with an apartment syndicator and we could whack 40% off the valuation uh, of 2020 purchases with very minor changes. So we could see a crash uh, in large apartment deals. Now, this is for the big boys. We're talking 100 unit deals and all of that. But still, a lot of people that watch podcasts and YouTube channels, they're limited partners in these things, right? They're, they're not the syndicator, they're the LP. And a lot of LPs have already lost their money. They just don't know it yet uh, because it's not going to, the, the pain's not going to be felt for a couple of years. Got it. So this lends your itself to buying one rental at a time too, because you're really not referring to small multifamily necessarily in the nope. two, four, two, three, four unit range. Cause I, I, when I think multifamily, I think that, but I think you're, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're referring to major apartment complexes that are just yeah. overpriced based on the way the market's going. Yeah. Anything you can get 30 year money on you're good. Right. Anything four units and below 30 year money. Good, right? Because what you don't want is the interest rate risk. If in the next two years, the average rate goes from 3% to 7 there will be plenty of apartments that go pop. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. So I know you're you're currently talking about or kind of alluding to, alluding to funding deals, right? And you mentioned that in the beginning, you were using your own cash. And Corey and I talked about this previously too. I believe we we're like, we're, we're sick of the cycle of you save up 20 to 50,000, yeah throw, invest it, not throw it away. And then <laughs> de deplete your bank account. Then you save it back up, you put it back in, save it back up, put it back in. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for someone like us that is looking to break that cycle and potentially go a different route. Like, is there a way to potentially build up your own bank, do some private, private money deals, or what does your expertise tell guys like us to do? 
Yeah. So I think there's, uh, there's a couple of things again, right. Um, for me, the only thing you're missing is time, right? You've done an amazing job getting to seven units. Uh, what, what you need to get to is that first recycle of capital, right? For, for us, I was lucky. It was California. I caught a nice wave. So I could recycle after three or three and a half years. I don't know your market at all, uh, but I'm guessing you've had some appreciation. Yeah. We're in the Philadelphia so market. What you can so do is a cash had- out refi at some point. Yeah, we haven't had California appreciation, but we have definitely had the last three years have been good to us. So we're we're probably not at that point where we could do it, but maybe you're maybe we're we you're are. Close. I don't know. We haven't ex- explored it. Yeah, for me uh, again, uh, I only can tell you what I did. The first thing is I went back to the bank and I did cash out refis on my previous purchases because we weren't saving enough to buy the fourth one. It, I, it, if I didn't do a cash out refi at like year three, it probably would have been another eighteen months until we could buy the fourth. But again, we, we, you know, 2002 to 2005 was a pretty good year in Cali. Um, so we just went back and we did that. And then we did it again and did it again. And then when prices got stupid, got, again, the other thing is I, I buy my stuff ho- planning to hold forever. That's my intention. But every once in a while, it's already happened to me a couple of times, the market gets wonky and I would not pay the prices that my stuff's worth and somebody else will overpay. So, you know, if you want to overpay for my houses, at 260 when I think they're worth 100, sure, take it and I'll 1031 into apartments, right? So the big thing for me is recycling capital. It just takes time. It could take five years until you've been doing it long enough where you get to recycle. Um, again, we got to 80 units recycling that same 40 grand. I mean, that's amazing, right? 40 grand Incredible. and then refis did it again. And then those same ones went to... Yeah. That's, this is why they say this is why they say that it gets easier, right? That your first four, five, six deals are the toughest because uh-huh. if you are using your own money, you literally have to continue to use your own money and then you have this portfolio that can serve as a bank account. But you essentially, right. yeah, you build yeah. your own bank. And then also, Michael, I know that you have a six and twenty percent program where you essentially like I guess flip turnkeys. Can you talk to that? Yeah. So another thing you'll get to do once you get into this is private money is a big deal, right? So I raised millions of dollars in private money two different times. So my first attempt at private money was during the crash and everybody was scared. So what did I do? I told all my friends, I'll pay them 10% interest only. So I bought a lot of houses and they were the, they were the bank and I paid them 10% interest on, on the entire purchase purchase price. And then I, I did the repairs. But what you're referring to is something I did after I retired, right? I had more time on my hands. Um, what I did is called a six and 20 program. So we'll do the math. Let's just say I bought a hundred K house. One of my friends would come in as the bank, the first position, I would pay him 6% interest only on hundred grand, which is $500 a month. Then I would, then I again fund the repairs. Let's say it's 30 grand. So we're in the property 130. Let's say I sell it for 160. And we'll forget transaction costs and all of that right now. So at least right now we look like we made 30 grand. So what I would do is, is we would sell the property. My lender would get their hundred K back plus what other monthly mortgage payments, right? $500 times however many months we had it. And then I would give them 20% of the 30 K profit. So in this case, six grand. So they walk away with a hundred plus a little bit of spending money from a monthly payments. And then they get six grand for the profit. And then I get to keep the other 24 in this example. Um, so yeah, that's perfect. six and 20 programs. Awesome. Yeah. I'm glad that you were able to like kind of frame out a private money lending deal and, and give our listeners an idea of like, it took me so long to figure out how private money truly worked. I was like, okay, I understand you borrow somebody's money, but how does the payment structure go? How do you pay them back? And then th- this is, that was very well explained. So I, I really appreciate that. I think- sure maybe the next thing that we want to talk about is you have a, a great definition of, or the def, the definition of what REOs are, because this was a, a major way that people were able to buy properties, especially in 2008 and 2009, or maybe 2009, 2010, 2011. Right now, what has happened is the eviction moratorium, it seems as though has not enabled this price drop to allow those to come back up. There's not a lot of REOs. What is an REO and how does it work? And, and, and did you purchase properties that way when you were building your portfolio? Yeah. I, uh, so from 2000, I don't know, probably 10 to 13, maybe it's all I bought was REO. So REO stands for real estate owned, REO, real estate owned. What is it? It's essentially when the bank, the lender 
uh, forecloses on a property, right? So let's just assume you own a house, you got laid off, whatever it is, you don't make your payments, right? So after 30 days, you get a letter in the mail that says, hey, we don't have your payment. 60 days goes by, they send you the same letter, except now it's pink. Like, hey, we really want you to see this because you haven't made your payment. They're probably calling you too, but whatever. So after 90 days, uh, they get the opportunity as a lender, given state rules, so every state's a little different. Uh, but after 90 days, they can file um, a notice of default. Basically, we've tried to make good. You've refused to pay. And the contract that you, the borrower, signed says that I can take this asset back if you don't pay, right? That was the contract you signed. So they file an NOD, notice of default. That then goes through its cycle, right? There's a process. It's three months or four months, however long it is for your state. Ultimately, at some point, it goes to an auction, at least in California, it goes to a trustee sale, uh, usually on the courthouse steps. I think now it's online, but when I was buying them, they were actually on the courthouse steps. So let's just go back to that example we had earlier, a 100K house with a 90K loan, right? So the the house is being foreclosed, let's say it's 94,000 bucks because of penalties and late fees and all of that stuff. The bank will be the opening bidder most of the time at 94, right? They just want their loan back. If some other bidder is out there like me, I'm like, oh, I like that house. I lived there before. Or for whatever reason, I can bid 95. The bank's good. It's my house, right? But what was happening in that time frame? nobody wanted the houses because all houses were falling in value, right? 5% a month. Uh, so banks were taking them back. So once they did that, they were no longer the lender. They were the owner. And unfortunately for banks, given their charter, and, and ownership of a house is a liability, not an asset. So now what happens is they have to sell it, usually via an REO agent. So they take this house. I think we said it was 94 grand. They call up an, R, an agent in, let's say, Fresno. That's where I am. And they say, hey, we got property address, 123 Main Street. What do you think it's worth? Oh, I know that house. I've been by it. It's a great house. Well, here's the keys. Go get in. They go get in. Oh, my God. Did you see it? They peed on the carpet. They busted up the walls. They stole the copper pipes, whatever it is. It's not worth 94. It's probably worth 38 or 63 or some other lower number. And then the bank lists it or the the agent listed on the MLS. And somebody like me watching would write an offer at 40 or 28 or whatever it was. And then the bank would either accept it. If the bank accepted it, they would take the 28 as cash and they'd write down the balance, write the debt, write the difference between 94 and 28 as a loss. That's why all the banks were losing money in 08, 09, because they were taking huge losses. And I would own the house and I would have to fix it for whatever was wrong and, and make it function again. So yeah, REOs were awesome. I bought a bunch of houses, duplexes, uh, bought a couple of triplexes. I bought apartments. Uh, when when stuff goes bad, it all goes bad. It's really cool. Um it seems like you're always ready for the downturn, which is great because I think a lot of people will listen to this and be like, all right, I got to like, it's it's a fine line to walk between deploying your cash in a bad time and then also not waiting too long that you just never do it, right? Um, can you talk to us or walk us through your most lucrative deal? One that you just like sticks out to you the most and you're like, hey, this is like, this is my home run deal and it just maybe gets someone sure. excited to jump in. Yeah, I think the one that people would probably most like to hear about. Uh, so 2012, Houses were already re- already starting to turn, but apartments were still falling, right? The, the thing about multifamily is it can hold on longer, right? If you if you lose a house, it's one, it's one. But if an apartment, maybe nine tenants aren't paying, nine are, so you can limp longer. But I bought, a, uh, I bought an 18 unit apartment building for nothing down. So I think this apartment building sold in like 07 for 1.4 million bucks. By the time I got to it, uh, it had been foreclosed and the seller or the bank was in trouble. So we had a connection via some other properties I bought and they met us at the property. We walked through every unit together, me and the bank president, right? It was really funny seeing this guy in a suit walking through these units. I'm sure he had never done that before. (laughs) Um, So we walked through them and they were wrecked, just wrecked. And I got out and it's like, all right, well, I'm, I buy this stuff all the time, right? None of that stuff scares me, but it clearly scared him. I said, what do you want to do? He says, um, we're, we're, we're willing to write this down to 700. I'm like, interesting. I'd pay 700. Like, really? Oh yeah, I'll pay 700. And he goes, well, what do you want to do? Well, I said, I'll pay 700. You finance hundred percent of the loan. Oh no, we can't do that. We, we, you, you need to put some skin in the game. I'm like, 
you didn't see those freaking units. You, you think I'm going to rent them like that? <laughs> so we went back and forth. I ended up having to put 50 grand in an escrow account. Uh, and then I had to give them a report every week on the repairs I were doing. Uh, I would have done the 50 grand anyway, but yeah, he financed the full 700 um, at below market rates. Uh, I used the full, I think I'm spending 70 grand. So I used, I used all the 50 grand and a little bit more. Uh, that unit's probably worth one eight, one nine today. So that's you know, incredible. Wow. Not a, not a bad deal. That's awesome. I, I'm curious. The first thing I'm curious about here is how you built a team to support all of this. Ryan and I are going through a process where we're, we have a great realtor. We have a great lender. We have a great title uh, person. Our contractors are building up, but like in order to build this portfolio or buy that complex, 18 units, whatever, and know that you have to do the rehab, you have to have this team that's ready. And something tells me, Michael, I don't know what it is, but something tells me that you're not the one that's swinging the hammer or at least swinging all the hammers in order to bring, (laughs) to bring this, uh, you know, oh, yes. unit to, to life. So like, what did you do to create this team yeah. to put, you know, you in a position to, to scale? Oh, uh, so what, how did I build out a team? It, basically um, you never stop building a team. You never stop building a team. Right. So it really starts from the very beginning. Uh, and I actually challenge everyone to try to add two people to your network every week. And if you can add two people to your network every week, there's 52 weeks in a year, that's a hundred people. You do that for 10 years, that's a thousand people. Um, so never stop networking. Also talk about real estate all the time. You'll never know where relationships can happen. You can find mentors and contractors and friends. And I've raised more private money by just being a blabbermouth talking about the projects we're doing. Uh, so yeah, never stop networking. Uh, ask, and again, during your networking, you're going to run into some limits, right? I've had contractors steal from me. I've had people disappoint me. I've had liars. But over time, you can build a pretty rock solid team. Yeah. And no, I don't swing a hammer or pick up a paintbrush. Yeah. It's funny you say that because so I, we had recently, I'm not going to say the, the person's name, but we had a young real estate investor reach out to us on Instagram and he said, hey, I, I, I want to start building my platform, uh, but I don't have any units yet, meaning like a, a social media based platform around what he wants to do. I don't have any units yet. Like, do you think I should like wait one to two years to start to build this platform before I have any units? And I, he, I, we always respond to our DMS, but I got to this kid like really quick. And I was like, dude, listen to me, do not wait to build a platform. You're going to meet people just by talking about this, wherever you go, whatever you do, you're just going to keep talking about it. And you're going to build this communication skill set as well as the network around you. That's going to help you get there that much faster. So just talk about it and then post pictures of uh, you looking at Zillow. Like, you know, it doesn't even matter just as long as you start somewhere and start to gain some traction. So I think that that kind of translates to what you were saying is just, I met my mentor. We happened to work together. One of my mentors in real estate came up in a conversation and now he's uh, helping us do a rehab, right? It just, it's so it's, uh, it's, it's amazing how that, how that happens. I really do like that advice for two people a week. I mean, over a hundred people here. No, not many people are going to do that, to be mm-hmm. honest, but it would really set you up and then you can start weeding people out. Um, I know I want to, yeah. And let's be clear that, that, that two people, I, I, it's really, people think that goal is crazy. Like I can't meet two people a week. I'm like, do you know two people in your market? Ask for referrals, ask for warm leads. It's remarkably easy. Every agent you talk to, hey, do you have investors in your Rolodex? Hey, who do you use for title? Hey, who do you use for this? Hey, who do you use for that? Once you get 10 people, you'll be able to just spider web throughout your community. You should meet two people a week. And again, meet could be email, phone, text. And again, the other thing I'll give you here is tell everybody what your buy box is. The only way I got deals in 2020 is everybody knew what I bought. And when they found one, they called me. It's really cool. So I'm thinking about, we, we just toured a property today that we're um, potentially going to be doing closing the deal on um, and beginning another rehab starting in August, eh, between August and October and somewhere in that time frame. Um, yeah, the deal with, uh, but today was- we got a little scared. We like, we, we saw just the, all, you know, the amount of work that is going to go into it. And we're probably just stressed out because we're midway through rehab right now. We're like, Oh my God, we're about to just take on another one. Like, is this, is this worth it? Right. And we're like dissecting the process going through and through. But the reason I bring this up is we, we don't have a, a clear gauge on what this thing's going to rent for because the, the strange thing about this, uh, this specific property is it has 
a um, a single family home, three three. It's gonna be three bedroom, two one and a half bath, and then it has a um, either an ADU unit or a it's it's it used to be a barbershop. Used to so be it's a like barbershop attached unit. to it, it's a commercial unit, and then it also has a detached garage that you can rent too. So there's a lot of moving pieces here. And the reason I bring this up is like, I want to know when you're going through a rehab process or like make ready, what do you believe like increases or like makes the the rent fluctuate the most? Like how could we potentially get the most out of this deal that it, it's worthwhile in cash flow and then long-term appreciation? You know, we're not going to bet on that, but try to make it as most lucrative as we can. Yeah. So it comes in learning your market. So in my market, there are three things that drive rent. First bedroom count. Right. I have personally turned more two bedroom, one bath houses into three bedrooms than probably most people, right? Bedrooms matter. Number two is bathrooms. Even a half bath gets me more rent than a three, one, right? Three, one and a half. And then finally parking, right? For me, some of the older houses are street parking. Uh, some of the older ones that have been remodeled don't have a carport. Most of the new stuff has garages. Right. So those are the three things that drive rent in my area. Your, your market could be different. I don't know, but that's, those are the three things I look at. A well, no, three bedroom, I, two, go ahead. No, I, I just, I, sorry. I did not mean to cut you off. I, it's a great point because we're doing this full rehab anyway. So it's like to add half a bathroom or to add something like that, it's like, it's not going to increase our cost that much versus what it will increase it in terms of cash flow. If we can get, instead of $1,500 a month, if we can get $1,800 a month or something of that nature. And doing the research, where do you suggest people, like obviously Corey and I are going to do our due diligence, but like just for people yeah. listening to you, like where would you suggest that they get this information? You say, know your market, like where do yeah. you find it? So again, you could do all the online rentometer, I think is a great site, although they're behind. A lot of these online sites don't realize how fast rents are changing right now. So you can look at Craigslist as well, but the biggest thing to do is pick up the phone and call a property manager. Say, hey, I'm looking to rent a three or ask them, hey, do you have any three bedroom, one baths in this area? If so, what are they renting for? Right. Be a tenant, be a, be a prospect. Great and if, if they don't have any, say, what would you rent it for? Right. Just ask. Right. Property managers are used to um, interacting with pros prospects. Perfect. Oh, that's that's awesome. Thank you for the advice. We appreciate it. I think as we sort of transition and, and wind down the show a little bit, I want to talk about your book, uh, one rental at a time. It's sitting behind you there. People that are watching, I, I wanted to, it, it's one thing to, I say this all the time, but it's one thing to think about investing. And then it's another thing to invest. And then to formally write a book about your process, you have to clearly have the wealth of knowledge that you do. So like, why did you write this book? And what do you feel like this book offers people as, as they read it? Yeah. I wrote the book for my younger self. That was really my goal because again, right. I told you very early on, I was 30 years old, stumbling across the bookstore. I was trying to find a book about a full-time employee who did something for a long time and it worked out, right? That's what I wanted. I wanted to do, I was willing, it, again, it could have been stocks, but that already burned me. I was willing to commit, commit, focus for a decade, two decades, but I wanted proof or evidence that at the end of that decade, it could work out. I never found that book. So we did it. it. And I wrote, you know, one rental at a time has two sections. The, the first and larger section, it's probably 60 or 65% of the book is detailed review of our 15 year journey, the ups, the downs, the mistakes, the it's all there. Right? It's not a how to book. Don't buy it. Cause you think it's a how to book. It's a story of 15 years of investing. And then there's about 35 or 40% of, Hey, these are the lessons I learned. These are the, you know, if, if I could save you a couple of things, don't do this, do that. Uh, but that's the book. So I wrote it with the intention of you know, if I could go back in time and hand it to my 30 year old self, it would make me feel better. I really like that. Also behind you, I see the, the big, um, <laughs> let's call it a billboard here. The, sure. the one in 500. And I also yeah. saw this on your Instagram and I saw a picture with a fighter pilot in that was awesome up in the sky, holding that card up. If you want to hold it up again, what does that actually mean? And why did yeah. you create them? Yeah. So again, I I'm lucky enough. I have a wonderful life. Um, I can give back and have no no expectations, but I'm also competitive. So on May 31st, it's how fast these things come together. On May 31st, I'm looking at the last 18 months and I'm like, how many people have I helped buy a deal? 
And I went through my emails and I did the best I could. And, and near as I can tell, I helped 162 people buy a deal. I'm like, oh, that feels pretty cool, right? And then I'm looking at it going 162, 18 months, you know, that's like 10 a month. That kind of sucks. We can do better, right? So then I'm like, well, what can I do better? First number that came to mind was a thousand. I'm like, whoa, big boy, that's that's too big a number. <laughs> so then that then 500, right? And then I said, okay, 500 is a cold number, but let's try to do it in 12 months. So the contest behind me is 500 deals. And uh, between June 1st and May 31st of 2022, if one rental at a time meant anything to you, you can send me your address, DM me, and I will mail you one of these cards and I will count you on this. And as of last Sunday, we were at 50. In 28 days, people, they've done 50 deals in 28 days. And yeah, people are taking pictures and stuff. It's, it's quite amazing. And the biggest thing about it is I'm going to throw some money at this. So once we get there, because I think we will, I'm going to donate five grand. So 10 bucks a deal uh, to a food bank in Fresno because food insecurity is a big deal to me. Uh, I'm also going to do something stupid. I'm going to dye my hair purple just because. And then because uh, we like to give back, my mom of all people have reached out to me and said, she'll let me be interviewed or interview her and ask her all kinds of embarrassing questions about me as a kid. Mm, so love that. We're, we're going to have some fun. It's now, perfect. what is your stick with purple? I know we, uh, we touched <laughs> on this. Like, well, I, I it's all of your book. You, you yeah. dye the hair purple is just your favorite color. It's my favorite color and all it's, it's without question, a shout out to rich dad, poor dad. Cause that book changed my life. Love it that. Changed, it just really put me cool. on a different trajectory, but this purple without purple. questions of favorite, favorite book or favorite. Yeah. Color. Well, that's a perfect segue here. I mean, I guess you could uh, potentially use that for, as we get to the core four, which is the last or the second to last segment of our show, where we kind of get to know you a little bit more personally. And the first question is what is your favorite investing or business book? Rich said, poor dad, I know is, um, it's a major one for people, but do you have any others besides that? And besides your own? No. Yeah. I, I would never say my own. Cause that's, 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 that's just too much uh, for me. The <laughs> best, the best book is actually better than rich dad, poor dad for real estate investing is a book by Gary Keller. I think it's real estate millionaire. It's blue and white. Uh, and I love that book, not for only the book. So I've read that book a couple of times, but if you go in the back of the book, there's like 30 case studies, those case studies at the back of the book, I must've read those a hundred times. Because again, why? It talks about a person. This person had this job and they did these things, right? The, the summary is like a page and a half per person, but that was so close to what I was looking for. I mean, I read those for months just to feel like I could do it. We could do it, honey. I know we've only got four, but look at this person. They did it. We could do it too. Michael, uh, you and I are very similar. Uh, first off, I will say that, and this is a strange coincidence, but I, I mentioned to you, I was, I listened to your book on a trip to Massachusetts visiting family. I had like a six hour ride, crush your book. I think maybe it took a little bit of the ride back, but it, I loved it. And then I was, it just got me motivated again. I'm like, all right, I got to get another one in. So literally the next book that I'm reading is the millionaire real estate investor by Gary Keller. And I have it up here for proof. If you guys watch it, <laughs> I'm not lying. There it is. Three hours, 27 minutes left. It's like an 11 hour audible read. The only frustrating nice. part is like this amazing, like the stories you're talking about in the back are like the analytics and the numbers through it. I'm like, it's talking about all these worksheets. I'm like, damn it. I'm driving. And I wish I could just have these and go through them. Like start writing stuff down. Um, but the reason I, I bring it up is it's, I, I'm, I think you and I are similar in a lot of ways. Like I have a commission-based job. I absolutely love it. And I'm like all about the hustle and the chase, but I, I also need the stories of, I always want to know, like I see a millionaire, right. And maybe that's why I love doing this podcast. And I'm like, that's amazing, right? Like you're, you are, I'll talk to a lot of different people. Some people are extremely smart. Some people are, I feel like are on the, my same wavelength. Some people are like, how the hell are you a millionaire? And <laughs> I, I got it's, just, it's, yeah. so, it's so interesting to be like, I just want to know the story of how you got there. And if you could get there potentially, I think I could do it too with a little true and tried hard work, yeah. they call it. So yeah. um, this book yeah, provides those, that. It's just cool. Yeah, those, those stories at the end of that book, I mean, literally they were a, they were a lifesaver for me. Because again, right? We talked about earlier, right? You buy, you deploy all your capital, dude, you're stuck for like a year. And I could just go back to those stories and go, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We'll get there, we'll get there. It's so pretty cool. awesome. Good recommendation. Got so, it. Second question. The second question four. the core four is, what is the biggest mistake you've made along your investing journey and how have you learned from it? So maybe one of our listeners won't go through the same uh, hoops. 
Yeah. The biggest one for me, we briefly touched on it was assuming that single family, my experience with single family would translate to apartments. Uh, I assumed apartments were like houses uh, and they're just not, they're not financially. They're not tenant wise. The headaches are different. Uh, you know, so-and-so plays their TV too long. They got a barking dog. They got kids. So-and-so is drunk all the time. They slam their door. They're parking in my spot. I mean, the, the hassle factor of owning apartments is so much higher than houses. Uh, and I didn't plan for that change. And it was, it was a rough couple of years financially. And, you know, after you have to, there, you have to run different numbers. And I just didn't know that that was a, uh, it worked out, but man, that was a rough 18 months. That's great advice. And I hope somebody listens to that, knowing that, that, that you have to run them differently and treat them as kind of separate businesses and, and not just assume that if something works for a single family, that it will for a multifamily. So good advice. Um, the third question is who is your who for 2021? And by meeting this person, you feel like your life or your business will kind of be propelled to the next level. And we always say that if you, if you don't have someone that you're looking to meet, maybe somebody that has that you have met in the past that have helped you kind of obtain the, the wealth and, and um, helped you along the path to where you are now. Yeah. The person that I would like to meet just to shake their hand because they've really helped me um, get my mind right. Right. You go through cycles in life. And whenever I, whenever I need to feel better, I listen to Gary V. I would love to shake Gary V's hand just to say, just to say, thank you. Um, I think he's authentic. I think he's a hustler. Uh, I think his heart is in the right place. you got to like the way he speaks because he, he swears all the time, um, which is cool by me, but not by everyone. But dude, I would, I would give anything to shake Gary V's hand and maybe take a, a selfie with him. I've read a couple of his books. I'd love an autograph. Yeah. That'd you can't, cool. you can't knock, you know, maybe, maybe people don't like him. It's kind of like a, uh, if you get big enough, some, someone's not going to like you for whatever reason, but mm -hmm. uh, you can't knock Gary V for the hustle. And I think the authenticity is the number one thing that people look at him and say, well, you know what? He's unapologetically himself mm -hmm. and he's built himself to this level. So clearly yeah, and I, I give that. Gary V 100% credit. And I've actually mentioned this on my, my channel a couple of times. He inspired me for my YouTube channel, right? He had a conversation with Nipsey hustle before Nipsey hustle was tragically murdered. And he basically challenged Nipsey to create a song a day for 365 days, which is crazy, right? For a musician. And I'm driving back from Fresno. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go create content every day on my YouTube channel. And now I create five or six original pieces of content seven days a week on my channel because of Gary V. So I'd love to shake his hand someday. That's a, that's a really cool that you bring that up. Cause Gary V was like one of the original guys who was like, create more content, like d put out two videos a day. And I, I remember us thinking like, can we do that? Like are people going to get annoyed with us? And it was just like, his message was just continue to do it and do it authentically and do it almost like without expectation of anything in return. And as long as your content is the way that you want it to be, there will be people that find value in it. So I think that that's, uh, awesome to bring up. I think it, nobody said Gary Vee on our show yet. So yeah, it's really cool. It's like that 10,000 hour thing in the Malcolm Gladwell. It's like, once you just keep doing things over and over and over, you become a master and you keep learning, you get better every day. It's like things don't become easier. You just become better. Um, so love well that. Said. And, uh, last question of the core four is what do you want your legacy to be? So like, why are you doing this? I know you have a over, you know, a 200 unit portfolio. You, you clearly are financially free and, and you can do whatever you want, but like, What's your why? What do you want your legacy to be years from now? My legacy is something I want. I want something to outlive me by 50 years. That's what I want. I want to be helping people close deals, change their financial future 50 years after I'm dead. That's all I think about. Absolutely love that. So we've reached the last segment of the show. It's called The Last Drop. And this question is, if you could go back in time to maybe 18, 19 year old Michael, mm -hmm. what would you, what advice would you give him? What would you change? What would you do the same? And um, how could you change your life? I would tell myself in very aggressive, probably foul mouthed language that the rat race is real. And if I don't appreciate the rat race and, and what I would tell myself is if you do it right, you could be financially free and retired by 25. That's what I would tell myself. You can either work for 40 or 50 years like your father and, um, you know, maybe retire. Or if you got down to it and busted your ass, you could be done by 25 or 26. And I know how competitive I am at 18. I'd have, I'd have went for it. That's amazing. Great. 
perfect advice. Well, thank you very much. Um, we, you know, we're kind of winding down to the end here, but if people love the show and just thought you provided a wealth of knowledge, want to read your book, want to get to know you a little bit more and just pick your brain. I know you're a coach and, and you give back a lot on the daily. So how can someone get in touch with you and, and figure out um, where you are? Yeah. So the best thing to do is go to YouTube and subscribe to my channel one rental at a time, but you can go to Google at this point and type in one rental at a time and find me lots of places, YouTube, Instagram, website, book, you know, all that stuff. Thank you. Perfect. That's great. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure. We really appreciate you coming on. There's not that many people that we've interviewed that have done, have been through several market cycles, have had, you know, as many units as you have. And it's not really the units as much as the knowledge that comes along with it. And like just the willingness to be so open and share. So we really appreciate you coming on and, and uh, thanks again. Happy to come back anytime. Thank you very much.